so kudos. <laughs> All right, so first up to the open mic, who put herself very intentionally first, please welcome Marissa Hi. After a long absence from the writing nights uh, organization, yeah, she has returned. Seven years, right? Um, I just want to say it is almost exactly seven years since a night of poetic musicality, yep. which was my first writing nights. Uh, Steve Brayman and I had yep. our first writing nights tried books out together. Okay, I'm just going to do two. Um, this one is called The Second Ghost. It's in three parts, so bear with me. A Second Ghost. One. I dreamt you were dead, and I lived, telling people I don't know all about it. Details in waking memory escape, but it was sunny. I wore shorts, too. I can't hear anything except a voice like yours, but sure of more. Music mute, conversation dull, or done anything on purpose since I was 23, when I break up bleached my hair. It is not that I have an opposition to intention, but when you are accident prone, making plans is just scattering shattered bones or pressing a purple bruise. And when I asked to be kissed for the first time in more than a month, snow making me seem as something more, it was because I didn't know how I felt. There had been no determination of the difference between longing and crossing my fingers, so a kiss becomes an impetus, a new set of feelings, a flood that my body requests no levies for. And I fall again, or truly that first. It was no harder before, though a set of circumstances in place to tear through some years built chance spent code, or hope that always acted in place of backbone. All of it so easily fractured, like my wrist once, or an unknown, an unknown number of toes. I didn't know a lack of calculation amounted to a careless life, or that it was better to live a future than spend time predicting it. I still know when my knees will get scraped, yet I think now I will stow bandages in my pockets, a step towards purposeful. Thank you, this rocks. I love you <laughs> I wanted to tell her how unimaginably, <clears throat> how unimaginably beautiful she was, how I had never seen anyone who took my breath away like she did, the way her soul captured you when she was near and said, I'm not like the rest. She was like lightning striking the surface of the ocean, so strong and beautiful, yet so unaware of her own grace and power. She fills you with this unexplainable feeling, every love in his heart, heard into her ear. Let them out. All your secrets and demons, let them out. A wave of black souls and screams consumed him, each dark hand reaching out to rip him apart. His eyes started to glow blue as he put his palms together. Standing before these monstrous creatures, he looked them up and down with a smile. He whispered, I accept them all, and each one shall fall before our love, as he kissed her. This will be the last one. She was afraid and terrified of all the possibilities, what might happen between them. She slowly reached for her dagger, her eyes locked with his, the exchange between them so powerful. Her fingers carefully embraced the handle as her grip tightened, his eyes begging her to trust him with her fears. She pulled the blade from its sheath. He said, I'm not going anywhere. Her hand moved silently through the air. He said, it doesn't have to end this way. The blade cut deep. Tears fell from his eyes as he looked down. Why? 
the blade sticking out of her heart. She was afraid and terrified of all the possibilities, what might happen between them. But worse than that, she was afraid to be loved. Let's give another round of applause for Patrick, because it's his first time on the night. And that takes a lot of courage. Thank you for sharing with us tonight, Patrick. All right, our next person to the mic has both announcements and some of her own original writings to share. So please welcome Ariana Perry. Yeah. First off, I want to say thank you to everyone that's come. I've uh, been working hard to start getting things rolling with story sketches and sounds. This is actually our second event that we've hosted under this uh, new um, series that we're doing. Uh, just so you know, because I think all of you are, are new to this besides a couple people in the back, um, story sketches and sounds was started by both uh, me, Angie Hayes, who is a local Akron musician, and Todd V, who is basically her manager, but he also does videography for the Summit and also uh, PBS. So he's a, he's a great person. She's a great person. Um, I'm an okay person. <laughs> uh, and I've been learning so much from them. Um, I do encourage, if you haven't already done so, please like our Facebook page. Uh, we are committed to supporting the arts in Northeast Ohio. Uh, we're mainly doing music acts, but obviously we want to support poetry, we want to support the visual arts. I'm looking to get in a theater group that will be doing something here. Uh, been working really hard with Angie booking people. And then, if anyone here has an idea for an event that they have always wanted to do, thinks the Outpost would be a great spot to do it, I'm the person you would uh, like to talk to. We can even do things like festivals. Um, we have two stages, so there's, there's ways to do that, uh, different writing events. Um, there are some small stipulations, but that's obviously I will talk to. Uh, you know, we'll address that as it comes. And then, uh, this is my first time sharing at a poetry open mic. Woo! You did! Yeah! I used to write a lot in, uh, in high school, and then I quit. Um, focused more on the visual arts, and I've been back to writing pretty regularly for the past uh, two months or so. So this is, this is two of them. <laughs> I reside in the sidewalk crack. I'm in between. Living, breathing, loving, cursing my difference. I've always been here, unable to leave. A prisoner to the cement reality that exists on my right and my left. I can only move backwards and forwards, alone. Sometimes, I peer into the planes of existence on either side of me. But, I never leave my I am here, in the sidewalk crack, between existence, alone. Veils, thin veils, like those of a wedding, gossamer and fragile. Veils, thick veils, like those of a Saudi woman, heavy and hot. Our faces are covered, we are cloaked in lies, protecting beauty, protecting truth. Veils to the truth, veils to authenticity, veils to the soul. Why do we lie? Why do we deceive? Why do we cheat uninhibited? Do not hide behind what society expects from you. Let me see you, let me know you, let me love you. For in seeing you, I see myself. For in knowing you, I know myself. For in loving you, I love myself. So we should definitely clap and cheer again for Ariana. Keeping it going, we have 
Teresa Gattel Brightman. Woo! I'm heavily lifting the corners of Jupiter into my bedroom. My roommate's boyfriend is a battling average of chinchilla, is a batting average of chinchilla hats curled into the couch. In the mornings, I find him with chewed heirloom ivory piano keys falling from between chapped lips. I've been sweeping up the bite-shaped splinters for days. My roommate grinds purslane and moss into the living room rug, grazing while the boyfriend and I watch TV. I tear suture strips from the sun, wrap them scarf-wise around my throat in a caution, do not crucifix ribbon. Sodium scholarships bombardier the apartment until grasshoppers, thorax, mandibles, sluice every nozzle in the flat. A fascist dragon with hard-boiled skins bites off three of my fingers and names the other seven after the car. Once upon a time, when the world was new and the ground was fire and the sky was thick with star gas and light, the earth, fresh from creation's passage through a canal of plasma and violence, she opened her mouth to sing, her skin cooled and the oceans dropped from hydrogen clouds to set her axis spinning in song, a dervish worship, the terrestrial hymn praising primordial backscatter alm. As sand fuses into glass, into razor split atoms, as pressure transmutes leaf rot into coal, into crystals, as electric bolt leaves a brown blue homeland percussing and strumming the energies of existence, we all sing her earth song of life. And your name is Earthquake Nation. Your name is Tectonic Culture. Your name is Crown of Flames. Your name is Sleeping Caldera. Your name is Igneous Rebellion. Your name is Howling Forests. Your name is Glacier in Opposition. Your name is Love of the Earth. Your name is Love of the Earth. Your name is Love. And that is why Teresa went to the National Poetry Slam. Yay! <laughs> All right, I'm having a hard time reading this next name. Oh, it looks sorry, like sorry. Robert <laughs> Bellerich. Beverage. Beverage. Okay, yes. So please welcome that guy. <laughs> You just kind of do. Short crust. You pick up the mezzaluna, cut butter into flour, do not understand the consistency until you realize someone has already added the milk. Another pie ruined. Apple, boysenberry, sweet potato. You bite back a scream, jerk upright, awake in the NICU. A plurality of respirators. This is damn near impossible to read. Just imagine I'm not breathing. It's called The Hidden Path. After all this time and all the missing persons reports and the detours to Our Lady of Chestahova and a lost child and a frantic search and a found child who may still not be the child who was lost in the first place, and car trouble and whether the cops are your friend or your enemy and the special nightmare that was your time in the hospital, and all this because you got up a little after midnight to make a peanut butter and apricot jam sandwich and a glass of milk because dinner was a little on the light side. You pull up and open the front door and call out your husband's name and there is no robotic songbirds hover around your head. A monotone crown of beaks, of claws, hungry for the worms you have always felt live in your gut, or perhaps behind it, neighbors of spleen, colon, appendix. None will come close to the match once lit. All are loath to taste fingers smeared with butane. This is your life, or at least the life you have found a way to inhabit. The target is across the street on your left. You shake the can just enough. short sets, I'm just going to do one more. There we go. I think you found it. Oh, but 
doing something real pointed, but I think I'll play safe. Turn on my TV and what did I see? Guy in the box was yelling at me, telling me everything's black and white. All I got to do is turn to the I blame my energy. And I'll hold it again. Color TV <laughs> showed me a black and white be the first time I've heard of a human being messing up radio waves, but... <laughs> Such as? I'm 
Mm -hmm. Master of the Metro 1A on Friday the 3rd. Mm -hmm. And at the substation in Wadsworth on the 18th. Awesome. So yes, make sure to check those out as well. Woo! All right. Our next poet is someone whose poetry I've only heard performed in my living room previously. <laughs> So please welcome to the mic, Finn! Woo! Hello. Hello. Hi. Okay. Problems of being short if you don't already know them. Microphones are never at your height. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, Ariana, because I call her Ari, um, left out one very important announcement for all of you, and that's that she's my fucking girlfriend. Yeah! Woo! <laughs> she decided to leave that point out. So I have two new poems. Two new poems. So you could call that new shit a double deuce. That was a joke I wrote. Well, I was sitting back there. Apparently, it did not fly. I will go back to the drawing board on it. It's better when shit doesn't fly. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> okay, so the first one's called The Breakup. Alright. So, setting the scene. I'm sitting in my therapist's room, complaining about my inability to connect with people, including my newfound love, although its pureness befuddles me. Good use of vocab word there. She saw through me in ways that were just mind-blowing, both terrifyingly excitement and powerfully vulnerable. So I meet this beautiful woman. She was amazing, the entire package, as if I ordered her right off Amazon and got super prime benefits one day, not two. Uh, so I did what any rational, logical thinking human being would do, and I fucking panicked. Right? I don't know why, I just panicked. Like, pacing the room, ripping my hair out, counting things that don't exist, panic. Placing blame on everything else. Until I finally realized the problem. I was cheating on her. Because I was already married. I was married to my dysfunction. It, it was such a committed relationship, and I was so invested in the chaos, the instability, the drama, the pain, that there was little room for her. See, dysfunction and I go way back. Like, we're old friends that get into shit, that talk about it later, and then come back to the drawing board about it over beers. Like, it gave me reason for my addictions. It helped me realize my fault in every person but my own. I was selective and kind when it was selective and kind when needed, though it always had careful destruction. Dysfunction and I met when I was five. It was in a pool shower with a neighbor boy. He was 19. Our relationship grew in childhood through a loving, neglect, and compassionate abuse of my alcoholic parents. Aren't they nice? And had a falling out in early high school when I started to let go of my family bonds and thought we could just be friends, but I felt it was too much apart. But we felt it was too much to be apart from each other. And in our love, dysfunction found me again. This time it was in an army recruiter. It was at his house. We tied the knot in the military and ever involved parent to dysfunction and we flourished and built a home there out of my deployment scars and war stories and proud medals. Pride is a strong but fragile foundation. So now, seven years later, look at us so perfectly in tune. Our movements, thoughts, and desires function as one. Dysfunction was always there, until dysfunction met its match in the loving, kind, and patient arms of a perfect woman. Dysfunction suddenly didn't have a place anymore, so we divorced. I tried rationalizing with it, made excuses for it, said it was, you know, my fault, not their fault, to make dysfunction leave. And still dysfunction drives by my house, singing its siren tunes out the windows, and still passes by me in the streets, begging to come back. That's good timing. Good timing. But it doesn't stay long. It was so perfect. And someday 
my dysfunction will only be a fading photo as a, a, as a has-been, tucked behind a frame newly painted with peaceful compassion that I just fondly look at like a vacation photo no one cares about. So when I meet people and they ask about us, I say, no, 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 dysfunction and I broke up. How's your relationship with yours? That's it. It just happened. This one is about a dream that I had, so I decided to write it down in a sort of poetic way. It's called my Ode to My Little Brother. Little brother, what a strange level of celestial mas masculinity you exude right now. Your youthful blonde, and blue, bl blonde hair and blue eyes all bewilder me against such a fitting, glossing armor. Its splendor weeps, weeps with acceptance of the battle to come, and to me it seems big, like you're trying to fit on my helmet, but it sort of falls and cuts your nose. Armor, sword, spear, shield, helmet. I hope that the wings on your helmet help you fly, little brother. Tonight, it comes to its waypoint crossroad. Tonight, it is decided by inches and seconds. Tonight, it's not for mistakes. Tonight, will you survive? I calm this by routine, organized battle plans. All commanders know their role, and so do you. Do you? How can I do this to you? I know you are ready, you are ready but practice arenas are not war. Oh, little brother, you are too young. You must be, for seeing you standing before me in a uniform for combat, I see only a child who naively follows me. Tonight, there is no naivety. We know our purpose and our directions. Quarrels erupted over this moment, you begging with me with both logic and passion, for which I beamed with pride and then discontent, your needs for this battle despite my reservations. Oh, oh my little brother, I wished, prayed, and sacrificed so that you would not have to carry a burden like this, but we share a look before the charge and your eyes beam with youthful adrenaline. And I know that my little brother has now become a prince and a king. Clashing metals and spluttering buds blood and all, of, and all of the gore of close combat, taking in your skill, I am admiring you. A blind, on the blind side, a man is charging, and Valkyries are hovering, and I scream to you, stay close to me, but there is not time. And I dive and take your death. Change my name, change your name with mine for the little man who does not make mistakes in war games. Oh, little brother, my little brother, I don't know I don't want you to carry my burden. I am sorry for what I could not do, the promises I could not keep. I refused. But as Valhalla rose and fury took over, I whispered this silent prayer. I will be with you, little brother. Such a beautiful bedraggled man, such a tragic, tragic and exhilarated prince, and such a loving and compassionate king. But all I feel is your tear falling across my cheek. I am sorry, little brother, that you had to grow in this way. No, you are loved. Thank you very much, Finn. You're welcome. One of the cool new things we're doing at Writing Nights in Stark County is this thing called Sword Fight, S-W-O-R-D Fight. So what that is, it's kind of a, um, it's two poets going head to head in a competition. And so it's kind of like an epic rap battle, it's kind of like an MMA fight, it's kind of like a lot of things. And so Finn will be one of our competitors in August, second Friday, who will be uh, competing against our next open micer, Daria Quinn. Please welcome Daria! Yeah! Daria! enjoy the words that are coming out of my mouth, I have a foreplay available for sale, $1. You can see me after the show and right here. we'll get you hooked up. So this first one, we're going to start with a song that dates all the way back to 2008. This was originally written as a protest song against the vice presidential candidate Sarah Palin. <laughs> it has been updated since. This is the current version. 
Jesus has ordained me as a saint to rule over the United States with an iron fist and an iron will. I'll reform this nation better still. We'll all be Christian. We'll all be saved. One God, uh, nation under God or else. I'll do what I want. I don't give a fuck. I'll bully the world to get what I want. I'll ban all the books that I don't like. <clears throat> I'll fire anyone that won't tell my line. And I won't take shit from anyone, especially the press, when they do their job. I'll suppress your freedom and control your thoughts. It'll be just like 1984. Because I'll do what I want. I don't give a fuck. <laughs> I'll bully the world to get what I want. Because Jesus has ordained me as a saint to rule over the United States. So don't you fuck with me. <clears throat> or else you'll pay. I will reform this nation either way. If you're not with me, you're against me. Between a girl and a gun. I'll do what I want. I don't give a fuck. I'll bully the world to get what I want. So look out now, because here we come. This is the alt-right America. Mm. Yeah. I can't imagine you can figure out where the Sarah Palin references were and all that. <laughs> okay. Um, this one was based on an unfortunate message on the current uh, First Lady's coat visiting some immigrants recently. I don't really care, do you? Because poor literacy is so cool. Let's pull these families apart and shrug like it's not your fault. So you lock them in a cage while suburbia cheers away because little do they understand that this is how holocausts begin. Mm. To concentrate your undesirables, squeeze their blood to oil your gears, scream about putting country first as if this country deserves to live at all. Murder enemy and ally alike, they'll all be enemies soon enough. Until all that there's left to say is, I really don't care. Do you? And this last one was this last one was also inspired by that tasteless thing. And also loosely based on a uh, Bob Dylan song. Get red or get dead, everybody go to bed. Kim Jong-un just got himself a warhead. Trump's in the White House, we're in the poorhouse. White folk talking about Nazis like they're Mickey Mouse. Caging up immigrants, snapping and snatching up all the kids. Selling to white folk, living up in Norfolk. Institute a travel ban, send them back to Pakistan. Spend a billion dollars to institute some space cops while telling poor folk to stop buying cell phones. You can either eat or you can have health care. You can't have both. So poor folks, be poor folks best beware. Spray tan America is kind of a shithole. I don't really care, do you? I didn't think so. Thank you very much, Daria. Yeah. I don't have to introduce the next poet, because I'm already up here. Uh, Woo! Earlier, after an amazing performance, um, someone said, how can I follow that? And I really do have a poem on that subject. <laughs> You've heard it 7,503 times, at least once today. A performer shakes the stage with their incredible essence, and the next person on the mic squeaks out, how can I possibly follow that? <laughs> and the audience is sure they can't. How you follow that is by owning your truth, by speaking with your voice and raising your reason. We must stop constructing false quotas. If so-and-so tonight was great, then no one else will measure up. We can't be blown away by more than one performer at a time. Nor is the audience a monolith. I'm sure someone was unimpressed with the one before. So you follow that by following your soul down the path only it knows. You follow that by making this night an ongoing, continuous revelation of truth shared by many mouths. You follow that. You follow that. You don't shrink away and diminish your own After you're done. You just witness awesomeness. How dare you let that dim your sparkle? You follow that because you are the only one who can. Monday at a different poetry event. This woman braves the world each day with her own face on display. 
Another woman delights in dozens of hues to paint her skinful canvas. That woman slays up and down the corporate chutes and ladders. Another woman dedicates all waking and barely sleeping moments to home and family. Fighting for civil rights, cooking for hungry bellies, raising our voices, quieting our hearts. And these are just of the few of the women's ways I know. We have countless styles of expression and impression. So it's no compliment when you, a man, declare to me that I am not like the other girls. Oh, you know, you don't start drama. Man, you are sincerely stupid for thinking that is praise. I am like other girls. Don't separate me from my sisters. I long for the resilience of black women fighting to keep their children alive. Someday, I may have the unquenched sexiness of women who use wheelchairs and the word selection of aut autistic women poets. Trans women who know their power comes from within. Ladies, I want to be like you when I grow up. I am like other girls, and other girls are like me. The creative problem solving of women experiencing poverty, the hope of girls who long to learn to read and have safe bathrooms. The strength of women who rise up over rapes and beatings and murder attempts. They prevail and we prevail because we are stronger and smarter than the nonsense in our way. But you have a point. I am not like black women because no stranger has mistaken me for a sex worker or turned me down for a job because of my skin color. I am not like Latinx women whose anger is diminished as spicy. I am not like transgender women because stepping out my door doesn't give others as much license to attack and kill. I am not like women who live with anxiety disorders defined by compulsive quadruple checking. I am not like the Pakistani girls who learn the alphabet in secret and pray not to be married off at 11 or 12 to a 60-year-old violent alcoholic. I am not like the girls and women who struggle to complete school over the wails of a dozen babies and absent partners. I am not like them, but we are all the same. We can all listen to and empower each other. We can amplify the voices of each unheard one, because I am like the other girls, when I lend my privilege as leverage, when my benefits are shared. No one is free until we all are free. I am like the other girls. Thank you. Rounding out the recorded portion of the open mic, please welcome to the stage, Azrael Johnson! since the night is about transitions, I wanted to uh, read something sort of transitory. Um, so I haven't released a chapbook in a year or three, so um, I was going through some of my old stuff, I'm like, oh, what should I put into a chapbook? And when I was reading over it, I was like, this looks kind of like a weird poem, so I'm gonna read this part first, and then I'm gonna close out with uh, one that's a little better. So this doesn't make in all the sense, that's just the way it happens. Legal pad. Every man should write a novel. Black five star. The day begins with a whimper. As a male, my impotence. A limb falls off. Did you hear? I wonder if my words... The old man. The morning fog. The sky looks... Save it. Wasp paper tomes, sentinels. When people cry, there are certain people, carpe diem OCD. I'm a babysitter, shoes, dementia, dementia. All right, okay, right, I'll skip the rest of them. I was mostly just to feel out if it was, if it was interesting to anyone else but me. <laughs> I was in both. You were, you were in what? <laughs> in you were in both. Vote? Invoked. 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 All right. Fine. I'll do 
this one. All right, ready five star. Subject, chat book submission. I would. Plastic is some rich government official, the divining bowl. If you would kill, it's funny how a grazing base I appreciate. Gay? Fine by me. If you empty me, replace me. The boy I used to be. Names red, I shake. Ultimate warrior, the smell. So how many of you like diabetes? I know I do. Boo. So sweet. <laughs> um, I had my pencil marking the page, and then guess what I did with my pencil? I put it in my pocket. Because I'm smart. The anticipation consumes me before sugar ever hits my lips. I know well the smell of baked goods, the lashing of my tongue by granulated goodness, the pure caning of my taste buds by the oncoming sweetness. All my life I've known when something was going to be too sweet, but like a slave I was chained to its consumption. No. Not a slave. I had a choice. I made the choice. I took in every bite with relish or ketchup in disgust, <laughs> but I ate it all. I ate too much all the time. I made the choice. As a child, maybe I didn't know any better. My brother gorged himself, so I thought I could too, and I did. I fell asleep after big meals like the men in my family. I thought that was normal. There was so much less information back then to begin with, and as a child I had the least of it, and as a child I had the most trust for people who didn't know what was best for me, but tried, at least in some cases. I've been getting high on fructose for as long as I can remember, and my dealers were my family. It's true, you shouldn't get high on your own supply. The sugar crosses my lips, tongue, down my throat, hits my stomach. I've always had a stomach that can stand anything. Hot food, mass amounts, give me anything except lima beans, weirdly enough. No discomfort, no vomiting. Combine a cast iron stomach with a revulsion towards wasting food, and I've got a recipe for fat aster. I've always been fat, other than a few extra layers and twice the density I looked like I did when I wrestled 112 pounds in high school. I've had a dad bod since before the term was in vogue, long enough before I was old enough to be a dad. The sugar collects in my body. My pancreas fights for its life inside me, producing or possibly, probably, overburdening itself. A sponge squeezed and re-squeezed until there is no liquid left, then squeezed again until it is a dry husk of an organ. At least that's the progression. My kidneys don't know how to process the urea and have become damaged, spewing protein like an oil pipeline. My body is a disaster area, a terrorist aftermath, and my life is the resistance to it. Thank you. Thank you, Azrael. So what Azra was reminding me up here on stage was to make sure to mention that at this point we are turning off the cameras, we are turning off Facebook Live, and if you want to share a, a piece or two without the pressure of, oh no, who else is watching, um, because it's just all of us who are right here, then this is your time. Um, so Ed put himself on here for 